We will be in the book of Proverbs today. I'll take my text from Proverbs chapter number 22. Proverbs chapter 22. Father's Day 2022. What a day. Looking forward to today. Thank you for being here today. It's a joy to have you. Father's so good to have you today. God, I do have a couple more things to add to Brother Curtis. Listen carefully. Uh, man, that's two years has been a trial, hasn't it? Not only for me, but for the church. And I am just so pleased. God has been so good to me. And uh, I'm getting stronger week by week. This past week, I had uh, started moving around with hand crutches. So I'm looking forward to getting off the walker. And it uh, seems like uh, God gives strength. I could tell you several stories, but I'm not going to bore you with that today. I do want you to know that we're improving all the time and looking forward to that. It's been a trial not only for me, but for this church. And so, God willing, those things are in our rearview mirror. We won't look back. We're going to look ahead. Uh, I do want to ask you to do something, and so listen carefully. Uh, we're looking at planning. We're in the process of planning Bible School 2023. 2022 is uh, coming and going pretty quick, but and we've had uh, several trials that's kind of handed us from Bible school, but looking forward to 2023, and I've got some ideals that are different. Now, you know, if you've been here for very long, we do things a little bit different at Berea Baptist Church, and I've got some ideals, but to do those, I'd like to ask for some volunteers not to work. Listen carefully. I'm not asking for volunteers to work by Vacation Bible School 2023. I'm not asking for volunteers for that yet. I'm asking for people that would like to work and help the church in planning 2023. I've got some plans. I've got some things I'd like to throw out at you and see if it works, if it sticks, and uh, get your thoughts on it and get you to help me plan that. So if you would like to actively be involved in the planning we're talking about just the planning of Vacation Bible School 2023. You see me before you leave today, and we'll start getting together and talking about that. So that's uh, something pretty important. Mark that down. If you're interested, see me before you leave today. And then uh, I want to know, I'd like to meet with each person in the church who has a church key a church key or keys. And the reason we're doing that is this way, God willing, we'll be installing an alarm system because of the recent break-in that we had. And uh, you won't be able to use your keys. So uh, you'll need to let me know that you've got a key and it's a time to account for those where they're all at. They've each got a number. I'd like to get the numbers off your keys. If you have a church key, you see me before you leave today and we'll try to get those numbers. So... That's all I've got. Proverbs chapter number 22. I'm so glad you're here. Visitors, it's so good to have you guys with us. If you see somebody that you've not saw before, it's been a while, make your way over and introduce yourself and let them know you're glad that they're here today. Proverbs chapter 23, as we look at Father's Day 2022. Proverbs 22, verse number 28. Proverbs 22, verse 28. The book says, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have said. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day that we can get together in honor of fathers. God, fathers are so important, and you've said so in your book, God. I pray you strengthen the fathers that are here. God, not only the fathers, but also the men and the ladies. And God, I pray that the each person that's gathered here today, that you'll speak to them with your Holy Spirit today and you'll bring them to a place of decision for you. God, I pray that we leave here today stronger and better people than when we came in. For Father, only you can do that great work. I pray that you help me to preach, lead and guide me. God, let my mind be clear. God, I pray you guide me into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father's Day talk about fathers today and as I read my Bible when I see Proverbs chapter 22 the end of the chapter uh, those last five six verses Solomon really writes them as a word to the wise and I thought you know as I'm dealing with Father's Day today I'm really talking about wisdom you know some things for the dads some things that are wise and here it talks about not removing the landmark I want to talk about that 
But when I got to thinking about that, I got to thinking about some things that I've learned over the years. Or maybe I didn't learn them at all. Perhaps it's just stuff stuck in my head. And my kids and grandkids, now they run around. I'm getting older, I'm getting gray. And now they're talking about all the stuff that dad used to say. Well, he didn't used to say this morning. Today he's going to say them. Let me give you Father's Day from my point of view. Here are some things that will help you along the way. I have, by the way, 25 of them. I'll not spend long with them because I've got a message I'd like to bring. But here's some things that you need to remember. If you're younger, these are important. I've lived a while and I've seen some things. I want you to remember these things. Number one, the man at the top of the mountain didn't fall there. He didn't just show up one day. Never underestimate the power of human stupidity. An excuse is a poor patch for the garment of failure. Always throw away the box when you take the last piece of candy. I learned that from being married. Honesty is like a trail. Once you get off it, you realize you're lost. Remember who you are and where you came from. Wherever you are in life, first make friends with the cook. Don't shake the tree too hard. You never know what might fall out. A closed mouth gathers no feet. The second time you get kicked in the head by a mule, it's not a learning experience. Never, never buy anything that eats. You need to do what you have to do before you can do what you want to do. Well, you know what happens when you rest with pigs? You get dirty and they love it. If you don't need it, don't buy it. Never be so broke you cannot afford to pay attention. Successful people make a habit of doing things that failures don't like to do. Don't let your studies interfere with your education. Don't be foolish just because you know how. Peer pressure is a crack in the armor of your own conviction. Knowing what's right from wrong is education. Doing what's right is execution. The latter part's the hard part. The difference always is attitude. You have to eat an elephant in small bites. The one who quits last wins. The potential means you haven't done your best yet. Potential means you haven't done your best yet. And if everybody else is doing it, it's probably wrong. Here, the song in the, in the book of Proverbs, the preacher writes, and here in verse 28, he said, Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. A landmark was designed to mark the boundary of a land. A landmark can be any mark or any fixed object. It's any portion of territory may be known and preserved. Many old landmarks in our nation, in Christianity, the things that mark the boundaries of what we believe and who we are, many of the old landmarks are being removed. I believe the present societal problems facing America in a large part can be blamed on the failure of men in the past three generations. Marital failures, gang violence, homosexuality, rampant immorality, ungodliness, gender confusion, and a plethora of society ills are laid at the feet of the generation of men who will or will not follow the discretion, the direction of a loving God to have a prosperous society. We are in many ways in America like Israel. Israel, the chosen of God, they found that the cost of their sin was going to be paid by their children. And I'll tell you, the cost of our sin will be paid by our children. I find that not only our children, but their children and their children's children from generations to come. From the year's failure comes a voice from those that follow us. Even our own children. Who send this message to the fathers gathered here today? God says we should preserve 
the landmark. But first, before we preserve the landmark, let's identify them. Let me give you what I believe are seven of, I believe, of the landmarks that we're losing. I want to show you those today. We'll begin, and we're going to look at several scriptures, so stay, keep up with me if you can. If you can't, just listen. I'm going to look at several scriptures today, and the first one I'm going to look at, looking at those, keeping those landmarks, is Psalms 119, verse 101. Psalms 119, 101. I'm going to tell you something. We're talking about landmark. It is the marker. It defines where we live. It defines where we go. It defines where we farm. It defines where we grow the future. The first of those that tells us what is the landmark, what it defines where we are. I'll tell you the first one I want to mention today to you is the Bible. The Bible tells us in Psalm 101, Psalm 119, 101. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Why are we got every evil way? Why are we running rampant? Why are we lawless in the street? Well, I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. Verse number 2, 102. I have not departed from thy judgments which thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Through thy precepts I get understanding, though I hate every evil way, every false way. None. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I hear that quoted, but we don't quote the rest of it. Verse number one. I have refrained my feet from every evil way that I might keep thy word. The Bible, the word of God, is is a landmark that God gave us to mark where we go. Oh, the fathers of yesteryear stood on the Word of God. They were active. They were active in living the Word of God, reading the Word of God, living what it said. Oh, we have lost so much today. We have gotten so far away from the Word of God. We don't even have the Bible anymore. Now people are going, what is truth? What is the Bible? They disagree. I read all these Bibles and they disagree. And by the way, they do. I've read them. They disagree. So how do I know it's truth? Well, the Lord says, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. I carry this Bible, this old King James Bible. People say, well, you're just a dinosaur. Brr, call me a dinosaur if you like. But I tell you, I've still got a Bible that still speaks to me. It's shaped my life. It's shaped my marriage and my home and my church. Oh, I'll tell you, it's an old landmark. It marks the boundaries of things. It's important that we have a pure word of God. Oh, I'll tell you, the Bible's a landmark. Tell you another one that we're losing. Titus chapter 1, verse number 3. Paul writing to his son in the faith. And he says this. But hath in due times manifest his word through preaching which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Preaching is a landmark. It is a boundary. It sets, it sets, if you will, a marker. We have lost what's preaching today. I was teaching a Bible class many years ago, and I had a student who was in a church that was of like faith. And I asked him, I said, what is the most, I asked the whole class, I said, what is the most important Part of preaching. Hand went up immediately. Sir, he said, we got to entertain them. There's the problem. Preaching is not entertaining. Oh, and most of you will realize, if you've been here for a while, I'm not entertaining. If I had to make a living as an entertainer, I wouldn't make it. Matter of fact, most of my jokes are horrible. I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to preach and teach. I am a teacher of the Word of God. Thank God for teachers. Brother Carl's a teacher of the Word of God. I appreciate the lesson today as he's talking about David and the stone that killed Goliath and how that will affect the Antichrist. Man, that was some good stuff. If you're missing the Bible teaching, you're missing one of the best parts of church. Preaching. But preaching is different. Preaching the word, preaching comes from a root word that means to stab or to prick the soul. 
preaching of a call for a decision. All preaching calls for a decision. I could go through many stories about that, but I won't. The Bible bears that out. He says there's teaching and there's preaching, and today I preach. I remember many years ago, I just started the church, and I had a fellow that was attending the church, and he says, so you teach and you preach? And I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, how will I know the difference? I said, when you figure it out, you let me know. Well, I remember what long after that I preached on the great one. I preached on the lake of fire. And after the service, he came back to me and his hair stuck out behind him. It's on fire. And he goes, I got it. I know the difference now. <laughs> it is different. Sometimes it's not pleasant. But it's necessary. The preaching is important. He said, in due time manifest his word through preaching, which was committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. I was called into a ministry to preach. Teaching developed over years. I read the word of God and fell in love with it. God began to give me some things to teach others. Not to call for a decision necessarily, but to get the word of God out there and explain it. That's a gift. Thank you, God. Preaching is a call. Preaching has been lost all today. We don't preach in our churches. Be careful about preaching. People don't want to hear that. I'm not here to please you. And I know some of you will walk away and go, I can't believe he said that. I'm here to please the King of glory. I'm here to please the one that saved me. I'm here to please the one that called me into the ministry. Oh, before I stand, I pray and I read and I study my Bible. And as God is, I'm studying my Bible through the week. God will take a portion of Scripture and He begins to turn it around and He begins to churn it inside. And if you get an itch, you've got to go give it to somebody. I love to preach. I love to preach in the pulpit. I love to preach on the street corner. I love to preach in retirement homes and nursing homes and jails. And Man, what a great, great walk it's been. You say, well, they don't want to hear it. I heard a police officer once tell a street preacher, he said, why don't you guys go preach somewhere where people want to hear you? And the street preacher says, if you'll show me where that's at, and I've adopted that as my own saying, if you'll just show me where that is, I'll be glad to go do that. Oh, I'll tell you that not only do they want to hear it, but they need to hear it. It's a landmark. I'm going to tell you another one that's a landmark. We're talking about landmarks. 1 Peter 1, verse number 15. As I begin to think about landmarks, Scripture became to mind. And I'll tell you a landmark. 1 Peter 1, verse 15. Brother Peter writes, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it's written, be ye holy, for I am holy. You know what a landmark is? One of those marks of where we abide, marks where we stop, where we don't go beyond. Where is our land that we live in? What is a landmark? Holiness. It's right there. We don't go beyond holiness. It's a landmark. When it gets to the point it's no longer holy, we don't go there. You know why God did that? You say, well, God's just trying to keep us from having fun. No. God put boundaries. And this book is full of boundaries. And he says, that's holiness. Stop there. Because when you go out there, on the other side of the landmark, it's dangerous. There's danger. There's harm. Fear. Don't go beyond that marker. You say, why do you do certain things and don't do them? Because God said so. People say, you're nuts. My friend, you're missing it. I am so far beyond nuts. They haven't made a name for me yet. I'm well beyond that. See, I believe still in holiness. Oh, America, we've lost something. Now we have happiness. You see, you don't think I ought to be happy? Oh, I do. I think you ought to be happy. You know what the Lord said? 
Lord said in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10, to eat the fat and drink the sweet. The Lord said, I've given you something good. Enjoy it. Be happy. But in America, we've lost something. We have sacrificed holiness for happiness. I read a blog recently that really captured the essence for me. I want to read you what the guy wrote. The author is writing about his own family. I wanted to read you this. The author wrote, I remember the phone call and the subsequent conversations that changed my life vividly. This is what the author writes. The author writes this. The phone call said that he got, the fellow on the phone said, it's my time to be happy. The author said, it was my father's voice giving me one of the reasons he was leaving my mother after nearly 30 years. My father was walking away from his job and his marriage in the pursuit of happiness. I wish I could say that's unique. But I've heard that. I talked with a saint of God that was living in sin. And I saw what it was going to do and I saw what they were doing and I knew the results of what they were doing. I saw it in the book. I saw it in life. The book bears it out and I knew what they were doing was going to destroy them, their family, their peace and bring nothing but heartache. And I told them, I said, it's wrong. What you're doing is wrong. It's sin. It's sin. And it's going to hurt you. And you know what they said? I'm just wanting to have a good time. What's wrong with having a good time? Fast forward now three years. The good time has busted their family all to pieces. Their children are going into perdition and they're crying and they're weeping and they're going, what do I do? Be happy. Happiness. We have traded happiness for holiness. My flesh wants to do it. It makes me happy. I want to sleep around. It makes me happy. Happy! Oh, my friend, there's a payday for that. The Bible says, Be not deceived, for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall they also reap. You say, well, good, if I sow happiness, I'm going to get happiness. No, you sow unrighteousness, you're going to get unrighteousness. It's not going to be happy. Happiness is a peril thing, perilous thing. Did we forget when the Lord gave the Sermon on the Mount? Have we forgot what He said? We find in the book of Matthew chapter 5 when the Lord has given those, we call them the Beatitudes. And He said things about, blessed are those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Have we forgot? The Lord said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Don't sound happy. Blessed are they, those that mourn. That don't sound happy. My Savior was a man of sorrow. I'm not preaching against being happy. If you enjoy something, do it. If it's not sinful. If it doesn't go against the Word of God. And you know, inside of every one of you, God wrote on your heart. And He says so. The tablets of your heart, He wrote certain commandments. And when you go wrong, you know it. And if you're saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside you and He goes, No, stop! You know. I find that played out on Facebook and Twitter. We follow that. Uh, the follow the church. Church has one. They try the folks that do that. Uh, uh, Brother Kate and uh, others that post. They try to give something that will be a help to you. But I watch so many people, they post things on Facebook and it's dumb stuff because they're being happy. And I look at what they're posting and I go, that is so wrong. But they, were, they revel in their sin and it's all about, am I happy? I want the world to know I'm happy. See, I know that those things they're doing are not going to bring happiness in the long term. I'm happy. Man, I have a good life. I wish you could get a sample of my life. You say, I don't want your life. You're in a wheelchair and on a walker. You don't know. 
I wish I could give you just a, I wish I could get you a little cup of my life each day and let you have a sip. I went through a tremendous trial. And I'll tell you something, as a congregation, I wouldn't have traded that for the joy that I have today for anything. If I went back, you say, would you have not done it if you had your choice? Oh no, if I knew that it would break what I have today, I would gladly have went through it time and time again. My wife may have a disagreement about that, but that's my thought on the matter. I wished, I wished I could give you just a cup of the joy. See, I don't have to get drunk to be happy. I don't have to cheat on my wife to be happy. I don't have to run other people down and talk bad about them to be happy. Oh, if you're doing that, you know why you're doing it? You have something inside you that is tormenting you to the point that you've got to belch out the hurt. I don't have to do that. I am so happy. My wife will tell you there's times that just break out in uncontrolled laughter. She'll go, what are you laughing about? I go, nothing. She goes, nothing. I said, well, maybe it's something, but it's all for me. I'm just happy. Oh, church, I'm not fussing about happiness, but I'm telling you that happiness is wrong when you forsake holiness. When you get to the point that you get away from the Word of God and you start living and doing things that are sinful. And you know what that is. To be happy. You have forsaken holiness for happiness. And I will tell you today that we're losing the landmark of holiness. Happiness is a perilous thing. It focuses our attention on ourselves and how we feel for the moment. But moments change. People change. Happiness will not hold. It's a season. Happiness is a side effect. Written when things are going well and your dopamine levels are up. Happiness is great to enjoy in the moment, but to spend a lifetime chasing it warps, warps it into an idol that you start to pursue. Happiness is not something to pursue. Holiness is something to pursue. Be holy and you'll be happy. I praise Jesus. I praise a Jesus that doesn't walk away from me as bride even when I'm flawed, even when I don't bring him happiness, he doesn't walk away. Jesus, he spent his entire life on earth not teaching how to be happy, but how to be holy. He's a perfect example of what it looks like to sacrifice human happiness for God's holiness. The cross didn't make him happy. Christ was in distress and pain and he died. Between happiness and holiness... Jesus chose holy. He chose to make me and you holy. He wants to make us holy. He gave His Holy Spirit. As many as received Him to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. I praise God, a God that doesn't give up on us, even when we don't make Him happy. Are you holy today? If you're holy, you'll soon find happy. Holiness is a landmark. Matthew 16, 18. Matthew 16, 18. We're talking about landmarks. Certain things that we were given that mark where we live, where we abide, our boundaries of where we sow and reap, our boundaries. I'll tell you, the church is a landmark. The church is a landmark. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus speaking. Jesus said, Matthew 16, 18, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock, speaking to himself, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The church. Jesus died that he might pull an assembly out of the world into his followers called the church. The church of the living God. There's many organizations out there that are not church. You say, what is a church? It's a called out assembly. It's those he has redeemed those that he bought with his blood that accepted the gift of God for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ it's those that have forsaken 
sin and a path that leads to hell and turned to Christ and accepted the gift of God. And with those, he took those and he put them in a church. And he said, I'm now calling you out to live holy and be different. You say, why is Berea Baptist Church different? We're supposed to be. Well, I'll tell you, the church is a landmark. Paul wrote to young Timothy in 1 Timothy 3.15. And he explained it. We've talked about this in our evening studies, our Sunday evening studies. Paul wrote, But if I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. You say, why are we struggling with truth in America? We're losing church. We're losing those that preach. We're losing the word of God in them. We're losing the church that Jesus called. Our work is in here with one another infrastructure we deal with each other we strengthen one another and our work is out there to a lost and dying world that needs an answer you've got the answer go tell them that's our work we have the truth you got to take it to them where did you get that the church why do we focus so much on the word of God it's the truth that's what you need that's what a strong church is built out of I thank God for you. The church is a landmark. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. I'm going to tell you another landmark. Masculinity is a landmark. Masculinity is a landmark. 1 Corinthians 16, 13. Fathers, you men. You say, well, I'm not a father. Maybe you're not yet. Maybe you'll never be. God wrote this to the men. Men, I want to talk to men. Do you know what he said? For the men, God said, watch ye. Get your eyes open. Look around you. See what's going on. You say, how do I know what's going on? You put it back in the Word of God. He said, watch ye. Here you need this next, 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 the next statement. Stand fast in the faith. Be steady in the faith. Where do you get faith? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You get in the book. And now you stand in what the book says. The Word of God says, you men, you're to watch, you stand fast in the faith. Quit. Notice this, you like men. So what is that? Find something to quit. You know what that says? You don't get to do everything you want to do. Maybe you need to look at something and go, I don't need that. I quit. I quit. What have you quit lately? When was the last time you went and asked God, God, what have I got in my life that I don't need in my life? And when God goes, right there, and He will. Well, I quit. Quit you like men. It takes a man to quit. Any low-life scum dog can run out there and fornicate and take drugs and get drunk and fight and all that. Anybody can. That's nothing. You just run on your base instincts. But all oh, it takes a man to quit some things, to say, I'll not do that anymore. In my life, it's been full of quitting. I've had a lot of quitting. I stood fast in the faith, and God would go, stop. And I said, I'm done. You said, what did you quit, preacher? None of your business. Quit you like men. And notice he's not through with the verse. Be strong. A man's to be strong. You know what the ideal man is? I have come to the conclusion long ago that the ideal man, he is... Velvet and steel. He is still when the winds of life blow against him. He don't sway. He don't bow. He stands his ground. And whenever the world is getting hard to his family, he's a piece of velvet to go and find comfort. He is still in velvet. And if you're all steel, you're out of balance, sir. And if you're all velvet, you're out of balance, sir. You're to be strong. You know what that is? That is just old-fashioned masculinity. I don't have a feminine side. I tried to get in touch with it. I tried to find my feminine side. I don't have one. Oh well. <laughs> I'm good. I was talking with a dear couple this past week and we were talking about men. You know what? Men stink. Can I tell you that? It starts out when they're little boys. Little boys stink. 
I got two of my grandsons here today. Oh, I love them so much. They stink. Man, they'll take their shoes off and it'll stink an entire room up. It's like, how do you get something so small that smells so bad? They stink. And I wished I could say that it ends when they get older, but it don't. You know why teenagers wear cologne and put on so much deodorant? If they didn't, they stink. You know what? Men stink. You ladies are laughing. You're smiling. That's because you're married to one, aren't you? They stink. Now there is science out that says old men reduce a certain hormone and produces an old man smell. Old men stink. They do. You say, does that make you a man because you stink? No. I'm just telling you, I don't have a feminine side. My wife, she gets all prettied up and faced up. I just throw a jacket on and I say, good enough. Ain't trying to impress nobody but her. You say, what's the point? We need men. We have a generation today and men don't know what manhood is. You know why? Their fathers didn't pattern it. Their granddads didn't often. Oh, and some they did and they don't follow it. Be a man. Man up. Be a man. He said, well, I'm trying to get in touch with my feminine side. Stop. God didn't give you one. If you get one, you got to manufacture it. I don't have a feminine side. Masculinity is a landmark. We need men. I want to show you a verse. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. And this comes to mind when I see some of the mess going on around me today. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. The Bible says, know you not, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, know you not that unrighteousness shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now what I'm about to describe to you, God believes is unrighteous. Thus he just said so. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. You know what God said? God said people that sleep around, people that serve idols, covetous people. By the way, covetousness is idolatry in the scripture. He said all those people... All of those people are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on, nor effeminate. You say, what is that? That's a man that acts like a woman. It's a feminine man. God says it's ungodly. You say, well, you shouldn't talk bad about people. Don't act bad. I won't talk bad about you. Effeminate nor abusers of themselves with mankind, the scripture says. God said he wanted men to be men. Jesus Christ was the ultimate man. I never saw a man like Jesus. You say, prove he's a man. You go 40 days and 40 nights without eating and see how tough you are. You go to the cross willingly. Lay down your life. You're a man. And he didn't care if they liked what he said or not. He had it to say. He knew it was right and he said it. Masculinity is a landmark. Moving on, Ephesians 5, verse number 31. We're talking about landmarks. Where are the markers? Where do we live? What should we be doing as those markers? Well, I'm going to tell you something. And you know me, I preach a lot on family, a lot on marriage. Family is a landmark. Family is a landmark. So what is my family? It's a husband and wife that have committed to one another and any offspring they may have. Or if they don't have offspring, it's the two of them. Prove that, okay. Ephesians 5, 31. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Marriage is typical. It's typifying the church and the wedding of Jesus and his church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, you men, he's talking to you men, listen up, men. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular, you men, so love his wife even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. So what does reverence mean? Ladies, you're to be in awe of him. You see, you don't know him. You are in awe with him when you said, I do. You were in awe with the ring, weren't you? So why aren't you in awe now? When he does something, you ought to go, oh, 
Not, oh, you got to do it. Reverence her husband. You know what the Bible says, man? It says you're to love your wife even as yourself. Listen to me. There's not a man in here that stands in front of a mirror and slaps himself or punches himself. Why would you ever hit your wife? By the way, if you're hitting your wife, she ought to catch you in your sleep and take a frying pan and wear you out, you low-life dog. You ought to love her. Do you ever stand in the mirror, man, and look at the mirror and just chew yourself out for being stupid? Probably not. So why are you chewing on her? Since I have been slower, I started to say handicapped. The only handicap I am, I'm too crippled, too high for crutches. But since I have been much slower, I have to rely on my wife to do so much for me. And she don't do it my way. And you know what I've learned to do? Shut my mouth because she gets it done. Because she's smart and capable. You men, when I look in the mirror and I see me, I take care of me. When it comes time to eat, you know what I do? I make sure I eat well. And I make sure she eats well. Why? Because I love her more than I love me. You men, next time you start to go buy a golf club, Go buy her a dress first of the same value. You say, well, I won't be up for the golf club. That's the ideal. Next time you get ready to go buy a new gun, look at the price of that, and you could probably buy her several really nice dresses for what you're about to spend on that gun and maybe some shoes. Better yet, give her the money because you can't pick fashions, dude. You say, what are you saying? Before you go out and start living life for you, you're to love her like you love you. Have you ever thought about, do I love my wife like I love me? You know what that means? That's my wife sitting right back there. Most of you know that. You're not going to abuse her either. You're not going to mistreat her. If you do, I will come and get you. I promise. And I'll tell you, I could give you some examples of some people that found that out. I'm going to tell you some men that found out that they didn't want to go across her. Be kind to her. Disagree with her if you like. But don't mistreat her. Why? She's my wife. God gave her to me and I love her. The Bible says that your family, you're to love her as you do yourself. And if you do, there's a lot of things you won't do in this life. There's a lot of things you'll do different if she comes first. Put Jesus first and then comes your wife, men. Family is a landmark. I'll give you one more. Luke chapter 13 and verse 5. Luke 13 verse 5. The last landmark we're, leaving, we're losing in America. Salvation is a landmark. Salvation is a landmark. Your salvation is not because you're a good dude. Are you a good dude or a dudette? A dudus? Are you a good dudus? Good. I'm glad. You ain't going to heaven because of it. Well, I do good stuff. I help little old ladies across the street. Whoopee! Ain't going to get you to heaven. I love animals. Good, 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 good. We're to be a steward over the creation of God, but ain't going to get you to heaven. I'm going to get you there. America's preachers have stopped preaching salvation. Salvation only comes in a person. The Apostle Paul said, For I know whom, not what, but whom, I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. The Apostle Paul says, I will say because of a person. My friend, today I'll tell you that if you're on your way to heaven, it's because of a person, not because of what you're doing. For the wages, they come down. for all the sins in your life, all those sins, if Jesus doesn't redeem you, you've got to pay for those. And the Bible says, for God is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. 
God doesn't want anyone to die and go to hell. No one. That's what the Bible tells us. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. I witnessed to a man one time and I told him he must be born again. And he was rough, man. He was rough. He had scars all over him. And he told me, he said, sir, he called me, sir. He said, you don't know where I've been and you don't know what I've done. Joyous. Oh, what a wonderful thing to tell him. Jesus doesn't care. And I told him, I said, the Lord knows and he still doesn't care. He still loves you. Did you know that God loves you? People say, well, I just don't believe that a God of love would send me to hell. He's not. You're choosing to go there. And you're here today to hear a message to deliver you from that. Those of you listening online, you're hearing a message to deliver you from that. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, it's a gift, is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're losing that landmark in America people say well there's a lot of ways to heaven there is not there's only one way Jesus says for I am the way the truth and the life no man cometh unto the father but by me he was either a lunatic or a liar you take your choice or he was truly the son of God I choose to put my faith that he was truly the son of God salvation is a landmark Luke 13, 5. Let me tell you what Jesus said. Jesus said, I tell you, nay, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Jesus says, you've got to turn. You've got to turn from the direction you're headed in. Turn to me. I'm not talking about doing good works. I'm talking about giving your heart to Jesus. And the day he saves you, he'll change you from the inside out. I'm going to tell you, and I've told you the story in front of you today. Stands the monster. I was known in my younger years as the monster. Matter of fact, my family tells the story that when I was a little kid the size of my grandsons, the family used to say, well, here comes Bill and Sue. That's my mom and dad. They'd say, I love it when they come, but I wish they'd leave that kid at home. Why? He's a monster. And in my teenage years, Oh, I hardened my heart and became bitter and angry and did things that I wished I could go back and remove, but it's too late. But you know something? I had a God that loved me anyway. He loved the monster. You say, preacher, could God possibly love me? Yes, He can. <laughs> Why? Because He is love. Romans 10, 9 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. Oh, the key to know that he died for you on Calvary, and the third day he arose. You've got to know that. That's your faith. He said, thou shalt be saved, if you will acknowledge that. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believes in Him shall not be ashamed. You turn to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm going the wrong direction. I now ask You to save me. Lord, redeem me. He will. I've listened to little kids pray prayers. I didn't lead them in. The Holy Spirit that convicted them will give them the prayer and they'll pray. I've had people say, I don't know what to say. Just talk to God. You say what God lays on your heart. And all oh, they pray, the finest prayer. Why? It's the Holy Spirit dealing with them. And He's giving them eternal life. Father's landmarks. Don't remove the landmarks, He said. Don't remove the landmark. Well, we've got, there's seven of them. There could have been more. The Bible, preaching, holiness, the church, masculinity, family, and salvation. We still need those. Men, hold to those. Quit you like men. Be men. We need men today. Fathers, thank you for being the fathers you are. I'll ask you to stand. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Will you each please stand? Have the pianist to come. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for allowing me today to stand. 
in this place to open your book. God, it's been a privilege to preach. I pray now that you will take those who have listened today and that your Holy Spirit will have a work in both the saved and the unsaved. Those that have been born again, I pray they give to you what you ask of them now and that today they'll draw close to you through the preaching. God, I pray for the lost that today they will turn from their way to you. For you tell us that there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Turn them, dear Father, from their ways to your way, and I pray today they'll ask your Son to save them, they'll be saved. Lead us, dear Father, in the invitation to pray your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you softly play.